The Day of the Rope by Devin Stack Chapter 20 Jacob was pleased with his meeting with Alice. She might be a terrifying bitch to her underlings, but she was no match for him. Especially now that he was focused again. He had finally broken his fast and regained the strength that had dwindled in his time in this time of constant crisis. He was replenished now. The governor had delivered. She had been blonde, female, and probably about seven years old, and completely unmarked. The state troopers had brought her on board and spirited her away in the secure chamber located in the rear of this of his 737 before he had taken off. She would have been perfect if she hadn't been sedated. This meant that he would likely have to give her adrenaline shots to make her fully alert, and Jacob hated needles. The sight of blood didn't bother him in the least, but there was something about needles entering flesh that was unsettling to him. He found that it helped if he avoided administering shots in any kind of conventional way. He developed a, ve a method that eased his queasiness that involved placing the syringe in the palm of his hand and then making a fist like he was holding a knife. Then he would just close his eyes and forcefully bring the needle down with a stabbing motion. Of course, this introduced new problems. For in instance, if he'd been using too much force or if the needle got out of alignment, it resulted in bending or breaking the needle. Another problem was that this method sometimes left unsightly marks on perfect skin. Marks were inevitable, of course, but it was in poor taste to make them prematurely. It was like being seated at the best table in an exclusive restaurant, but when the waiter brings out your favorite dish, you notice a bite missing. Even if it's just a nibble, it ruins the whole experience. Presentation is everything. Jacob was pleasantly surprised when he managed to deliver the adrenaline without marring the perfection of his prize. He needed her alert with plenty of limbic system activity. For the next five hours, Jacob released his suffering into his girdon. As he deconstructed and fed on her purity, he rediscovered the serenity of sacrifice. He'd left his body completely, left it behind at 30,000 feet. He hovered above the earth, allowing his physical self to consume the offering the world had brought him. He'd felt the power that had been waning in him drained by his self-imposed fast, surging through him once again, filling up the emptiness and returning him back to the state of ascendancy he deserved. He was back in control. Alice must have felt it, too. The next day he had gone to see her and was amused to see her quivering. As they stood together alone in her bedroom, at first... He thought it might be her Parkinson's, but her eyes revealed the fear behind them. She was fearful but obedient when he ordered her to summon the two most faithful and loyal members to her, of her inner circle. To her credit, she hadn't hesitated. She made no complaints or pleas, just obeyed. Molly was a young woman in her late twenties and had been with Alice since her days as an intern. She was pretty and had been more than Alice's assistant and confidant. The truly faithful understand the real nature of their masters and Molly understood better than anyone. The man Alice had requested to join them his name was Philip, was someone Jacob had met during the campaign, and he'd had very little interaction with him. He was young 
in his 30s and had been a fixer for Alice in the same way Jacob had been a fixer for Eli. <clears throat> he rarely left Alice's side th during the campaign, but still managed to remain remotely and relatively anonymous. The entire campaign, he could be seen standing just off camera, taking note of reporters who strayed too far from the script so he could later make sure they never strayed again. These were Alice's most faithful. They would have the choice to serve as proxies for Alice and receive her punishment in her place. If they accepted, and they would have to do so willingly, Alice would be atoned. This would ensure that justice had been served and would also prove to Jacob whether, or not, Alice really was in control. Alice retrieved a small plain wooden box from inside the drawer next to her bed. She opened the box and held it out to Molly. Molly had stared inside the box for several moments and then reverently, reverently removed a blood-stained dagger with a decorative serpentine handle. She held the knife in both hands and looked at Alice for reassurance. Alice nodded quietly, and Molly began to cut away the straps of her blouse with the deceptively sharp blade. The fabric had fallen to the floor in clumps as the knife severed her clothing from her body with ease. Moments later, she had stood naked and trembling. She looked at Alice, and Alice had motioned towards Philip. Molly bowed her head and handed the blade to Philip, who, likewise, had cut his clothing until it lay in a heap at his feet. Alice looked at Jacob. He remembered watching her as her last hint of pride evaporated replaced with the cold, resolute pose that had preserved her for so long. She had held out her hand, and Philip placed the dagger in her palm. Alice had rolled the handle of the blade in her hand as, as if she was inspecting it for flaws, like a museum curator, appraising a priceless artifact of immense significance. She stroked the serpent that was engraved on the handle softly with her thumb and began to whisper quietly to herself. Her grasp tightened around the handle and she had raised the blade over her head. The voice had spoken to Jacob in that moment. Perhaps they all heard it. It had been so loud in Jacob's head he couldn't fathom how they couldn't have heard it. He had floated out of his body and watched in amusement as Alice partook of her redemption. When he had finished, when she had finished, the room smelled strongly of iron and bile. Alice was no longer shaking. She stood steadfast, eyes wide still clutching the dagger in her hands while warm blood dripped from her matted hair and down her aged and wrinkled body. Jacob saw the Alice, albeit an older and frailer version, whose eternal ambition had first made her a rising star. That star had since faded and would never shine as bright as her ambition but she had proven her loyalty and managed to confront the fates once again. He'd only left Alice's estate a few hours ago and Jacob's feeling of elation that had been conjured up in those blissful moments had already gone. Now there was a slight sense of emptiness that always followed the incredible high. He sat in the back of his limo, staring out the window at the airplanes on the tarmac. His driver had stopped at the security gate.
which just now occurred to him, was highly irregular. He watched as the airport security guard, who was shaking his head, spoke to his driver. Usually airport security just waved them through. Something unusual was happening. Jacob was tired of unusual things happening. <clears throat> the driver nodded to the security guard and then lowered the glass divider that separated them. I'm afraid they won't let us through, sir. Everything is on lockdown because of the terror attack. They've grounded all flights and shut off all access. The closest airport is Phoenix International. I can take you there, but it would take at least five hours. You could take a flight from there, or I can take you back to the hotel. Traffic is going to get worse as soon as people start to figure out how serious the situation is, so I would suggest leaving as soon as possible. How serious what situation is? Jacob asked, annoyed. Sorry, sir. I thought you knew what was going on out there. Seems as though about an hour ago there were, there were several terror attacks. They attacked the jet fuel lines and took out power, part of the power grid. They are declaring a state of emergency, grounding all flights. People are going to start rushing the gas stations if they think there's going to be a temporary gas shortage. Jacob was stunned. They hadn't planned any terror attacks. Why would they conduct terror attacks? Who was conducting terror attacks? In California of all places? I was not aware. Very well. I don't care where you take me, just get me back to New York. The driver nodded and said, I'll have you in Phoenix in about five hours. He raised the glass divider and begun turning around the limo. Jacob opened his laptop and started reading through the various alerts in his in, uh, that his intel people had apparently been sending to him. Starting sometime just before five this morning, several pipelines had been damaged in targeted bombings. They had managed to take out many of the fuel lines in the southern part of the state, but a big concern was that all the attacks had taken place in close proximity to the canal system that provided much of California's water supply. There had been massive contamination as a result. To make matters worse, the suspected terrorists had also succeeded in shutting off the power to about 10% of the state. Riots were already breaking out all over L.A. County. Another alert arrived in his inbox. Jacob's eyes narrowed as he read through the brief in disbelief. A faction of Anifus was taking credit for the attack, and the riot's massive army of online pundits were already creating memes and spinning the attacks to their advantage. Fuck! He shouted at his laptop, and then dialed up his assistant. I need all hands on deck on this. Give me a conference call with all our media people, top level only. This mess cannot get out of hand, and we cannot trust them to not fuck this up. Yes, sir, his assistant said. Followed by some clicking sounds as Jacob's call was routed to a newly created conference call. <clears throat> one by one, Jacob's, Jacob heard a beep, followed by a last name, as people were added to the call. After a few minutes, the beeps had stopped, and Jacob's assistant came back on the line. We have everyone except for CBZ. Benzinger is MIA. Then Bensinger is out of a job. This is an all-hands meeting, yelled Jacob angrily. I've got Lisa Sussman from CBZ. She wants to talk offline about Bensinger, said Jacob's assistant. There's nothing to talk about. He's finished. Jacob's phone buzzed, and he looked down to see that he had received a text message from his assistant. 
Benzinger missing as of yesterday. Wife said he never came home from the studio. Network is keeping quiet until instructed otherwise. Jacob read the message, then smashed his fist into the mini bar. A bottle of expensive vodka shattered and filled the back of the limo with the pungent scent of alcohol. Benziger wasn't the first network journalist to go missing in the last few days. Three days ago, the White House correspondent for TFN had gone out for drinks in, in Adams Morgan and never returned. They found his body yesterday face down in the fountain on Meridian Hill. A few days before that, an editor for the New York Reporter had been thrown in front of a train by someone witnesses claimed was a homeless man who had fled the scene. Jacob knew better. If it was a homeless man, it was the same homeless man that killed Ehrenberg and the others. <clears throat> Very well, Jacob said. We'll talk about this later. Get her on the call. Jacob scanned his alerts one last time and then took a deep breath. Nobody gets off this call until we work this thing out. I'm sure by now you're aware of what's happening in California. It seems there have been several attacks on fuel pipelines across the state. This would include consumer gas, natural gas, as well as airplane fuel or kerosene. It all now seems that the real target may have been the water supply. An Anifus group is already claiming responsibility on the internet. They are saying that this is all to demonstrate how differently the privileged people in California will be treated in contrast to the poor in Michigan, who haven't had clean water in years due to the problems with their infrastructure. Of course, we all know the real problem is the right-wing fascists who have been blocking all our attempts to send them aid. The claims of these so-called Anifis are false. It is a right-wing group disguising themselves as their enemies to shift the blame of these attacks onto us. These attacks were carried out by these right-wing extremists, and I believe this is a message we should be putting out immediately. Stacy Einstadt with RBC, a, woman, a woman's voice said, My concerns are that the only people who are going to believe us if we push out a theory like that, not that I doubt that it's true, but that because we don't have any tangible proof that we can wave in front of them, yet it's just going f to further erode our credibility and you don't have any credibility, Stacy, growled Jacob. I'm going to fix that. Since you people have proven entirely co incompetent when left to your own devices, I am simply giving you orders now. You push the story the way I tell you to push it, and you let me worry about evidence and credibility. We have intel that proves all of this, and by end of the week, we'll have all sorts of evidence. And you'll be able to paint the new media as crazy reactionaries that blame everything on those who stand up to their fascism, and the professionals in the real media. You're going to push the usual reasonable right-wing personalities? They, of course, are all very shocked by this rise of violent fascism and will make appearances on your shows to explain how their side has become dangerous and extreme. We'll have someone who fits the profile in custody for you to parade around soon enough. Stop acting like we haven't done this all before. Get the story out, make sure your audience hears the term right-wing extremist as many times as possible. I don't care if they ridicule you and cut, cut together montages of our people saying right-wing extremist like it's all some joke. We want that. 
Let them have their fun because it will backfire spectacularly when we bring out their terrorists so the whole world sees just how dangerous they are. Then we can focus on the real danger. The real danger is the right-wing extremists on the internet and the Silicon Valley billionaires that have been letting this kind of extreme speech take place on their platforms. In fact, I want you to plant the seed right now. They had their fun, and now they have become dangerous to democracy. When you're not saying right-wing extremists, I want you saying dangerous to democracy. Preferably in the same sentence. The blood is on the hands of the platforms that are allowing the hate speech to spread. Don't worry about dragging them through the mud too much. They are ready to play ball, and they get it. This is exactly what they need to shut this cancer down. What the public wants now is healthy speech. Free speech is sick. We're all for healthy speech. Healthy speech is the bedrock of our society, of our democracy. But hate speech has no place in our society. Jacob continued to give out talking points in real time, monitoring all the major networks from the back of his limo as it traveled east on I-10 towards Sky Harbor in Phoenix. He had been forwarding updates to Eli all morning, but he had yet to receive a response. This was out of character for his mentor, and the radio silence was unnerving. End of chapter 20.